let me go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Paul Nestat. Dr. Nestat is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he is the co-director of the Outpatient Anxiety Disorders Clinic. He also is an attending psychiatrist in the Esketamine Clinic and the Inpatient Dual Diagnosis Unit. Dr. Nestat's research focuses on practical risk factors for suicide, such as firearm access and opioid use. He also co-directs the doctoral level Suicide as a Public Health Problem course, a course in the School of Public Health. He is a fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and is on the executive board of the Maryland Psychiatric Society. Dr. Nestat has written several chapters for leading psychiatric and medical textbooks, over 50 peer-reviewed papers, and is the managing editor of the Johns Hopkins Psychiatry Guide. He has spoken nationally and internationally on the topics of suicide risk and the role of firearms, opiates, and the limitations of screening. So today he'll be speaking about anxiety. Welcome. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate you having me here. And I should probably, I should probably shorten that biography if I see since at the top. I appreciate you saying all those nice things though. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you about anxiety today. Um, and some of this does overlap a little bit with what you heard from Dr. Swartz. So I'm gonna skim over some of the aspects like uh, SSRIs, but we'll talk a little bit about a few aspects of anxiety disorders and, and their treatment. Um, the, the sort of outline of what we're talking about today includes having uh, we convey a basic understanding of, of the concepts of anxiety, worry, and fear, which I think are interrelated concepts that are helpful to distinguish. And we'll talk about some of the major uh, symptoms of anxiety disorders um, in, in specific syndromes. And we'll talk about, uh, really, I want to focus a lot on some of the behavioral principles that we use to treat anxiety disorders. I'm not funded by any uh, pharmaceutical funding, but I do get funding from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the NIH, uh, Bloomberg American Health Initiative. So really one of the first questions I'm asked often um, in talking about anxiety as a physician is, is anxiety always a disorder? Is it always a, something to treat, to be worried about? And I think that, uh, you know, by virtue of me talking about the fact that this is a question, it's clear that, that it's not. Um, this is just a picture from uh, last year. My, my car is that Honda CRV, the red one in the top right. And I was watching myself about to be towed, basically about to get a ticket and no parts, but as I was waiting for the elevator to leave my office, uh, in the Hampton House, and uh, and I felt very anxious. Um, I think anxiety is a normal thing that people would feel in certain situations. So I don't want anyone to come away from this talk thinking that anxiety as a as a whole is something to always be avoided and is always pathological. I do want to define the concept of anxiety a little bit more specifically, though. So I think it's best to think about the word anxiety as meaning sort of an inner nervous uneasiness. It's something that can affect all lots of aspects of the way that you go through your day your thoughts, your behaviors, and it can even have physical sensations of anxiety, which many of us are familiar with. It's essentially a state of high arousal. Um, and biologically, it can be thought of as an inhibition of the parasympathetic system. Let me, let me talk about that for a second. So, you know, many of you are familiar with the concept of the fight or flight system. Remember from sort of high school biology, this idea that, um, you know, if there's a, uh, a bear chasing you, then you're, um, you, you sort of activate the fight or flight uh, system, which is what uh, doctors would call the sympathetic nervous system, part of the autonomic nervous system. The parasympathetic system is, is what we use um, as sort of a break on that fight or flight response. So it's sort of like, it's more the rest and digest if you want a, a catchy um, rhyming phrase for it. Fight or flight is sympathetic, rest or digest is parasympathetic and anxiety inhibits or stops the rest or digest system. So it's essentially putting a break on the brakes, which increases fight or flight in that way. It matters for some reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Now, anxiety is a natural state. It's common to all animals. Animals experience anxiety, humans experience anxiety. And we often experience it as a driving force, something that helps us accomplish much. I can tell you, um, I never would have gotten through medical school without a little bit of anxiety, make sure I study for tests, that kind of thing. And it also serves a role as a preparatory state for danger in the future. There's danger pending, anxiety keeps on the alert and ready to react to that. It also facilitates the activation of fear, right? So by, by slowing down the parasympathetic system, it allows a sympathetic system, fight or flight, to kick into high gear, and that, that's fear. But let's talk about fear. So fear, again, is often an appropriate thing to experience. It's often an appropriate emotional response to real or perceived danger right now, right in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. Just like anxiety, it's a state of high arousal, um, meaning that it's sort of up, not, not relaxed. 
And unlike anxiety, it's not, a, it's not a deactivation of the parasympathetic fear, it's directly the activation of that fight or flight sympathetic system, right? It's an unusual set of, it's a, it's a useful set of biological changes that gets, get us ready to run. So it gets your blood pumping, gets your heart racing, uh, gets you increasing uh, your breathing so that you're ready to fuel yourself and get out of there. Anxiety gets you ready for fear, primes the body for fear. And the last concept I wanna talk about is, is worry. So worry is sort of the, the mental or, or thought component of anxiety. They're, they're mental attempts to avoid anticipated potential threats. We worry about something coming up um, as a way to sort of get ready for it. On its own, worry doesn't have bodily consequences. This isn't a, um, an autonomic nervous system issue like the other two concepts we discussed. It's just a thought component. In moderation, you can think about worry as just another word for preparation. But of course, you can suffer from over-preparation, over-worry, and that can become a problem. There's a good quote that I've seen attributed to Thomas Jefferson and to Mark Twain. I don't know who actually said it, but uh, let's say Mark Twain said, I'm an old man and I've known a great many troubles, but most of them have never happened. I think that characterizes worry really well, right? We sort of, it, nothing to fear but fear itself, so to speak, right? We, we worry about our worries, even if they're things that aren't worth worrying about, and that um, it's not great. So just to summarize here, anxiety primes your fear and worry is a thought component of anxiety. Okay. One of the useful concepts I just want to introduce before we start talking about anxiety in depth more is the concept of the yerkes dodson law. And this is something that comes out of a lot of different sorts of studies that have looked at caffeine intake and levels of anxiety. And it's basically things that increase arousal in the same sense I'm talking about. This sort of just like arousal is the opposite of sleepiness, right? Um, it turns out that if you're very low in arousal, like you haven't had enough coffee that day, or you just have no anxiety at all, um, you don't perform that well. I think of it about um, that old movie, Office Space. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where a guy was hypnotized to not worry about anything. And he was, he was happy in a lot of ways, and in other ways, he wasn't able to perform. Um, and of course, if you're too anxious, or, or I've had that 10th cup of coffee, which I think I might be on by now today, um, then you are too cranked up to actually perform to do well. You're unhappy, you're distressed, maybe even jittery physically, and people don't perform as well even on cognitive tests. But there is sort of a sweet spot, an optimal level that we want to go for. So I say this to say, no one wants to have, no one's going to benefit from having zero anxiety. It's an important part of how our brains work and how we deal with life. But having too much can be a problem. That is to say, anxiety is useful, except when it isn't. If anxiety is chronic, or if it's more severe than warranted, it can become disabled. Because if you're on constant alert for threats or, or what negative things are gonna happen next or worrying about danger, that's an unpleasant way to live. It's not a happy way to live and it can impair all sorts of aspects of your life. The same physical, cognitive and behavioral changes that anxiety triggers to avoid bad things. You know, good, good reasons to have anxiety and fear and worry. They can become pathological when it's inappropriate. So let, let's talk a little bit about aspects of anxiety when it's a little too much. So I remember I said in that last slide, anxiety can have physical, cognitive, and behavioral components. We're gonna talk about each one of those things just for a little bit. The physical components are what psychiatrists sometimes call the somatic body components of anxiety are, are mostly due to that autonomic nervous system that I started talking about a minute, the sympathetic nervous system or, or an inhibition or lack of inhibition on the parasympathetic. So some common bodily signs and some of the anxiety that most people are familiar with, including things like being busy, feeling your heart race, or feeling nauseous, or getting dry mouth, or blurry vision, or cold, clammy skin, overheating, that kind of thing. These are things that happen when you're very, very anxious. These are things that happen whether there's an anxiety disorder or not in an anxious situation. And it's important to recognize that these are normal things to happen when you're anxious. These are, these are what your body should be doing if there was a saber-toothed tiger chasing you, right? Um, we evolved to be able to have bodies that create those sorts of responses in an appropriate situation. So things like dizziness come about because we're hyperventilating. There's a release of adrenaline. These things make you dizzy, but if you were getting ready to run, they'd be really useful. That, that hyperventilation helps you do gas exchange so that your, your muscles can be fueled and you can blow off extra carbon dioxide. Your heart races for the same reason, to pump your blood to those muscles so you can run. You get nausea or abdominal pain in, in, in anxious situations because the sympathetic nervous system is designed during fight or flight to not prioritize digestion. It's not a time to digest and 
and sort of meaning physical digestion. Like if you're eating, the stomach stops getting all that important fuel. That blood is needed at the muscles. So in an inappropriate situation where you're not using your muscles, what you do notice is digestion has stopped and you might have nausea or abdominal pain. Dry mouth comes from inhibiting saliva, it's running. You, the hyperventilation and also pupillary dilation can cause that blurry vision, et cetera, et cetera. But basically all of the sorts of things that you start to notice when you're very, very anxious in extreme situations are your body doing exactly what it's supposed to, just it's doing it at an inappropriate time because there's not a saber-toothed tiger. And the kind of things that cause us anxiety these days aren't the kind of things we can just run from. And there's the thought component of anxiety or, or the cognitive components of anxiety. These are thought patterns that are designed to cope with perceived impending threats. And I defined those earlier as worries. The thought component is worries. With worry, you might find your mind sort of developing a cognitive tunnel vision. All you can think about is the threat you're worried about, but the test you have the next day or or what's gonna to happen to your friend in the hospital. Worrying about the future keeps you from noticing other things. Um, and that sense of impending doom, it's good because it gets you ready for any potential doom in that sense. But if you're just thinking about that, you don't, you don't allow yourself to notice good things happening or good signs. You're focused on the worst case scenario. So you don't notice things going well, you're distracted from things that are important that aren't bad things. And in pathological anxiety, it can be difficult to turn that worry off when it's time to turn off. The third and final component I wanna just talk about is the behavioral component of anxiety, things you do. So that might include things like uh, be feeling restless and so pacing or wringing your hands. Psychiatrists even have a term for this, like if you're sort of nervous and, and jittery, they call it psychomotor agitation, right? This sort of um, feeling like I gotta be doing something right now as an anxious symptom. Also things like difficulty concentrating can be an important aspect of anxiety. Irritability is a very important one. When you're anxious, you're much more likely, some people are much more likely to be more irritable. And actually this is an interesting one because irritability ends up being one of the main reasons people end up seeking treatment with, with a doctor like Dr. Schwartz or myself. Um, the other things they don't recognize as problematic, but when somebody else says, you know, you're so snappy, you're so irritable all the time these days, they start to recognize there's a problem there. And that's when they often seek help for anxiety. Also hypervigilance, which is something we associate with specific anxiety disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, but actually is common to many states of anxiety. Hypervigilance just means you're jumpy. You might allow noise to make you jump or you feel like you kind of need to know where the exits are to, to, to reassure yourself. Insomnia is another really important behavioral component of anxiety. In fact, there's even sort of a characteristic type of insomnia it tends to be with anxiety, people have trouble falling asleep. That's sort of insomnia in the early part of the night. Um, they have trouble falling asleep. Often they'll describe having racing thoughts or at least can't stop thinking about things that have a lot of emotional valence to them so they can't fall asleep. Insomnia is common in many psychiatric disorders and also on its own as a freestanding entity. But with anxiety, you see it early in the night as opposed to uh, with depression where insomnia can happen at any point in the night, but but characteristically it might happen early in the morning. You might wake up before you need to and can't get back to sleep. So someone's called late insomnia. Over-preparing, another behavioral component of anxiety. People might um, worry so much about an exam the next day that they, um, that they um, sharpen every pencil a hundred times and they end up not being able to get to sleep on time because they're doing everything they can to, to over-prepare for the exam or uh, over-color code and highlighting. You know, I talk to medical students a lot about these aspects of anxiety. And they, they often describe situations where they study really even more than they need to, to the point they're too exhausted to even get their answers out when it's test time. People with anxiety will also sometimes not take on tasks at work um, because they know how much an anxiety, even a simple task might cause them. And so they, they don't advance in their jobs in that way. And, and finally, another uh, good example of a behavioral component of anxiety is making lots and lots of lists and seeking reassurance like to-do lists and then lists of my to-do lists and then making sure that I'm doing things right, maybe asking others in my life, am I doing this right? Or trying to reassure yourself of failing and so looking for external validation, another behavioral component of anxiety. And finally, when we're talking about anxiety, uh, sometimes it's, it's useful to think about whether it is a state that you're in or if anxiety is a trait, like a personality trait. I think it's, it's useful to think about the fact that anxiety can really be either of those things. Anxiety can be a trait. People can be more or less anxious as a personality trait, just like we might be more or less shy 
or more or less outgoing um, or uh, emotional, there's some level of anxiety there. Um, but it can also be a state. You can sort of enter an anxious state um, because something's happening in your life, making you anxious or, or even out of nowhere sometimes. And a useful analogy can be to think about anxiety the same way as um, the temperature and the rain outside. A, a, a city might have a climate that's sort of generally hot, you know, um, and, you know, there's summer and winter and there's difference, but it's generally a warmer city, like let's say Atlanta, something like that. Um, but there, a city, the same city can also have weather, like even in a hot city, there might be snow sometimes. Um, or um, in, a, in a hot city, an extra hot day would be sort of that superimposed state of weather on top of a city's already hot climate. And so an anxiety can see the same thing. You can see someone who's at baseline very anxious. And so when their anxiety crests, it's particularly troubling to them. Or you can have a crest of anxiety in someone whose baseline is pretty low. Um, so it's, uh, it doesn't sort of add up to as disruptive. Now, I mentioned all these ways in which anxiety can be normal, but also I've been saying that there is such a thing as pathological anxiety or anxiety that's representative of an illness. And I just, I don't wanna go into the details of every anxiety disorder because there's many of them. Um, but here's sort of a good way to think of each one of the major anxiety disorders. Anxiety might be calibrated too high chronically. You worry too much about lots of things in lots of domains. And, and we call that generalized anxiety disorder. I like for each of these things, there's a, you know, a psychiatry textbook would list many specific symptoms that we can talk about in the Q&A if you're interested, but I think having this good summary is useful. Because you can also have anxiety that's just triggered by an inappropriate stimulus or too triggered by a stimulus. That's what a phobia is, right? People might feel uncomfortable around spiders, but if it's to the point where when they see a spider, they're tremendously scared and scream and run out of the room, um, and the fear of spiders keeps them from I don't know, leaving the house when they're uh, in a cabin in the woods on vacation because there might be a spider outside, um, that's a phobia, that actually causes dysfunction. Anxiety can be triggered by nothing at all, just sort of all of a sudden out of the blue, all those, especially those physical symptoms of anxiety can just hit you and that's what we call a panic attack. And those are relatively normal to be honest, about 11% of Americans will have a panic attack in any given year. Or you might have so much worry about having panic attacks and worry about the anxiety itself, worry that you'll have a panic attack that will keep you from doing things that might cause the panic attack, or you might not want to get in the car in case you have a panic attack while driving, or you might not want to go to the store in case you have a panic attack in the store. That's when it becomes pathological and becomes a panic disorder. You could also get stuck on one event that's already passed. You might have fear, a fearful experience, the fearful stimulus leaves, but you can't shake that fear and your brain is sort of in, in several ways stuck in that fearful state. And that's what we sometimes call post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Or you might have anxiety that's pathological, even if it's an appropriate reaction, but to an untenable or very difficult situation. So as I said, I work with a lot of medical students and medical school is very stressful, causes a lot of anxiety. And people will have a lot of these anxious um, feelings, which are normal to have in a high stress situation, but it becomes pathological when that normal to have anxiety causes disruption in their ability to to do their work or live their lives or be happy. And then it's worth addressing um, with things like, for instance, the kind of mindfulness meditation you'll be hearing about from Dr. Gould uh, after my talk. Which kind of brings us to treatment. So there's, there's a variety of ways to treat pathological anxiety. One of the first things I do when I'm treating someone that um, has an anxiety disorder, any of the sorts that we were just talking about, um, one of the first things I do is I uh, provide psychoeducation, basically, um, talk about or educate them on these psychiatric conditions. Essentially, what I do is present the 10 slides I just showed you, you know, verbally in a conversation. I might say things like, listen, anxiety is, is sometimes helpful, and maybe throughout your life it's been helpful at other times, but now it seems like it's cranked a little bit too high, it's causing distress. I'll say, you know, it's helpful to think about anxiety as having these three components, thought and behavior and, um, and uh, body, bodily sensations. And those things, again, are part of the sympathetic nervous system. Explaining all that sort of thing can help the patient or the person suffering from anxiety understand what's going on and sort of contextualize what's going on. Because it can be very scary if you think that's your body betraying you and you're having a heart attack and you don't know why. Like, no, no, your heart's racing because a, a normal part of your bodily system, the autonomic nervous system is being activated. It just shouldn't be being activated now. We're going to work on that. There's, th there's therapies that are based in, in groups, group therapies. Those are usually 
supportive therapies. They're not as useful for anxiety disorders as they are um, for other sorts of psychiatric conditions, behavioral conditions like substance use or eating disorders are all very responsive to group therapy, not as much for anxiety disorders, but they, they play a role. And there's a variety of one-on-one -on -one talk therapies or psychotherapies, um, many schools of thought, many ways to address them. I just wanna mention the three that um, you'll hear the most about as you um, read about or think about anxiety disorders. One is psychodynamic psychotherapy. Now psychodynamic psychotherapy is what people think about um, uh, when they think about therapy in the 1950s and 60s, right? This is sort of Sigmund Freud. The idea is that you'd spend a lot of time with a, a psychoanalyst, therapist, um, and the goal would be to sort of rehash or talk about your early life to look for the root of the worry. Like, how are you reliving uh, relationships you had as a child now or superimposing those ideas into your current relationships, that kind of thing. It's basically looking for the root of the worry. Why are you really anxious? You're not really scared of spiders. You're scared of what a spider represents or something like that. And that um, has a little less usefulness in, uh, in really pathological anxiety, but it's still done um, in, in some places. Then there's mindfulness, which uh, a version of which is, 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 is thought of as um, called these days acceptance or commitment therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. The idea with mindfulness is that, and this is a dramatic oversimplification, but the idea is that these worries don't need to be the focus of your life. You don't need to put so much valence on the worries. They can be ignored. A phrase that ACT sometimes takes from, from Buddhism is you can think of these worries like clouds passing in the sky. Those clouds are up there. The anxieties are there, but you don't need to stare at them the whole time they're passing. They can just be happening. You can be focused on what's going on right down here. You don't have to worry about those clouds. Whereas cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT in a way is sort of the opposite of that. It's saying, no, let's look at those clouds. Let's take a look and see if those are reasonable clouds. Let's see if it really makes sense for those clouds to be there or if those are irrational and there's a better way of thinking about things. And cognitive behavioral therapy has been studied a lot for both major depression and anxiety disorders. And it has a lot of evidence um, in large trials of really being tremendously effective for those conditions. So I wanna talk just a little bit more about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also called CBT. So CBT is a manualized therapy, meaning that there's literally a manual. Um, so your therapist would have read and, and you can read. Um, it generally consists of about, about a dozen sessions, anywhere from 10 to 20 sessions. Um, usually it'll be about an hour a week, but some people will do CBT twice a week or every other week, that kind of thing, but usually about an hour a week um, and usually delivered on an individual basis, but it can be done in small groups. It can even be done sort of online. Um, there are some, some online programs that are designed to be done at home that have become more popular for obvious reasons in the last two years during the pandemic. There's a variety of therapeutic strategies involved in the CBT, but it usually starts with, as I mentioned before, psychoeducation, just sort of saying, listen, let's, let's talk about what we think is going on. You know, we've been talking about how we think what you have is generalized anxiety disorder. Let's talk about generalized anxiety disorder, the epidemiology of it, how common it is, what it, what it generally feels like for people experiencing it. So the patient can come to say, oh yeah, that, I think that is what, that does sound right. That is what I've been experiencing, sort of like have that, that understanding. And then there's a variety of other aspects. We don't need to go into the details, but part of it might involve cognitive restructuring, which is sort of looking for, I'm talking about these clouds in the sky, looking at these maladaptive thoughts, these, these, these clouds of worry, and thinking about whether they're realistic or maybe they're, 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 um, they're not as rational as they seem. Um, there's also the behavioral component of, of um, CBT, um, which includes things like exposure. Um, so that might be learning to sit with that anxiety, or in the case of a phobia, actually exposing yourself to the stimulus that, that causes the phobia, looking at pictures of spiders, and then videos of spiders, maybe even holding a spider. And in, in through that exposure, getting sort of habituated or used to those things, they stop causing as much anxiety. Um, there's also a variety of other aspects like behavioral activation, sort of just going out there and, and doing things, not staying at home and sort of, and, uh, sort of stewing in those feelings. There's relaxation training, things like progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, that kind of thing, very helpful outside of actual acute anxiety attacks, but just to get your body in that, um, used to being able to relax. And CBT often involves a lot of homework. In fact, I, I often tell patients that if their CBT therapist hasn't been giving them homework to do before, between sessions, they're probably not actually getting CBT. It's a, it's a common problem in the community that there is, um, there'll be therapists that sort of propose, suggest that they offer CBT, but in reality, they're just doing more supportive psychotherapy. Um, um, and one of the ways you can tell is if you're getting homework in between. 
let's talk a little bit about one example of how CBT might work. Um, this is sort of more the exposure level of CBT. This is an example, there's a hypothetical um, uh, that, was, that was sort of first talked to me by Lisa Wyack, who's a provider in the community here, um, but I really like her slide. If you have a patient, uh, if you, you have a lot of fear about um, your daughter driving home in the dark, you scared your daughter might get into a car accident when she's leaving your house and driving home in the dark, or you know she's left to work and she left work late, so she's driving home and it's rainy or in other ways dangerous. So you have anxiety about that. The patient might have anxiety that she's going to crash. You can see my mouse here. She might have the fear that her daughter's gonna crash. And what happens then is as she thinks about her daughter crashing, the anxiety increases and she starts to call her daughter repeatedly um, she just wants to check in with her daughter, make sure she didn't crash and that she's still safe as she drives along home. When her daughter picks up the phone and says, mom, I'm fine. I keep telling you, I'm not, I can drive fine. That decreases the anxiety. Oh, what a relief. She's okay. That's fine. Um, and then as time goes by, well, now it's been five or 10 minutes. I know that she's at a different part of the road now. Uh oh, what if she's going to crash now? The anxiety increases. You call the daughter again because you know what to do, right? When you called her before, the anxiety decreased. You were rewarded by calling her. So you call her again because that'll make you feel better. And of course, yes, it decreases it. But this perpetuates a cycle where you keep calling to relieve that anxiety, which teaches you to call again to relieve the anxiety. CBT tries to break that cycle here in, in the cycle, right? The idea is a therapist would say to the patient, listen, this is what's happening, like draw this diagram for them. Your anxiety is increasing when you have this worry that she's gonna crash, this, this belief she's gonna crash. And the problem is you then behave in such a way, you relieve that anxiety by calling her and that just reinforces the bad habit. So next time I want you, when you're having that worry that she's gonna crash, I want you not to call. I want you to recognize that anxiety is something that's uncomfortable, but probably irrational. Looking at that cloud and saying, no, she's probably not gonna crash. She's driven many, many, many times before. It's, you know, Every time I call her, she's probably, and I want you to not call. And the longer you sit with that anxiety and don't call, it'll go away on its own. The body can't maintain that fight or flight state forever. It'll go away on its own. And you'll have taught yourself, oh, that's another way that I can make anxiety go away without calling my daughter. I can just give it a second. It's time to think about a better, more adaptive thought. Let it pass. And the more times the patient does that, the less anxiety they'll have. And every time they do call, it'll reinforce the negative, the, the sort of the, the maladaptive coping. And you can talk to them in therapy, that kind of thing, to work so it's more and more often enough. I think I'm running a little bit low on time. So maybe gonna skip over this a little bit so we can just talk a little bit about uh, medications for anxiety. Now, Dr. Swartz talked to you about, about medications for depression. And there's a lot of overlap between anxiety medications and depression medication. A good way to divide the medicines for anxiety into, is into the sort of these two columns that I've put up here on the screen. On the left, you see treatments that are quick, but temporary. That might include things like antihistamines, which are things like Benadryl, or something called Vistril or hydroxyzine. Um, and antihistamines will just sort of, they're just a little bit sedating, as anyone knows who's taken some Benadryl. And so they just kind of tamp down the anxiety they work very quickly, but they're temporary and ultimately are, are not a very sustainable way to deal with anxiety um, if it's become a chronic problem. They're really sort of an emergency medication, as are benzodiazepines. So these are medicines that have names like Valium or Ativan. Um, these are, they, they do work quickly the same way. They're basically just sedatives, um, but they are, um, again, not a long-term solution. And we're going to talk a little bit about them on the next slide. Just say that they're a quick acting, but temporary and not ideal solution for anxiety, although they are prescribed quite a bit, especially by primary care doctors. Then there are things called beta blockers, which actually come from uh, treatments for high blood pressure, hypertension. Beta blockers with things like propranolol um, can be used, especially in situations with performance anxiety or if there's sort of peripheral anxiety, sounds like, like that heart racing, right? So someone who doesn't have sort of chronic anxiety, but when they have to run a meeting at work or they have to give a performance or give a big speech, they get very nervous or take a big test, the beta blocker just basically slows your heart rate down. And in doing that, sort of breaks a cycle of anxiety building up. And it, it can be very effective in the short term. I remember my, my roommate in medical school would take a beta blocker before every big exam. He wasn't an anxious guy, but he got stressed about exams, so exams are stressful. Um, there are people that play in symphony orchestras that prefer to do this because they're not anxious generally, but when they think of a big performance in the orchestra, 
beta blocker just helps them get through that period um, and it can be very useful. Then there are the medications that don't work immediately, but they have a long lasting effect. And those are the ones that are essentially the same as, as the antidepressants that you heard about from Dr. Swartz. These are good for chronic frequent anxiety. Generally, you can start at a low dose and advance them. So they might take six to eight weeks to fully kick in and treating the anxiety. It's even a little bit longer than the four to six weeks we talk about in depression. So it can take a little bit longer. Um, and these are medicines that you've just heard about in the last talk, SSRIs, SNRIs, a little less often for anxiety, we use tricyclic antidepressants or MAOIs. There's a medication called Buspirone that um, is designed to treat anxiety specifically, although I haven't found it to be as effective. Uh, for some people it works, it's not usually my first choice. And then medications like Bupropion, maybe a little harsh when I put not here, that, that's also called Wellbutrin. It's a great antidepressant, but one that I haven't found to be as useful for anxiety, largely because it can be kind of activating itself. It increases energy, which is a good thing in some types of depression, but not always a good thing with anxiety. I mentioned I wanna talk a little bit more about benzodiazepines. So just sort of give you a quick overview. These are medicines that work on the GABA neurotransmitter in the brain, which is the same thing that alcohol works on or barbiturates work on but really it's just sort of a central nervous system depressant, sort of like is a sedative, is the best way to think about them. They're FDA approved for a variety of anxiety disorders and they, they were originally intended to be used as a short-term uh, situation. If there's a sort of a, an anxious, a temporary situation, like you've got a fear of flying, but you got to fly every six months. Okay, a benzodiazepine might help you get through that, right? But there's lots of downsides, especially when they start to become used in the long-term. Withdrawal is a big problem. Actually, withdrawal from benzodiazepine is one of the few medicines um, that we prescribe that uh, has withdrawal that can actually be fatal. Um, you can go into seizures and death if you stop benzodiazepines too quickly, um, much like you can with alcohol. Um, much worse than something like opiates, which is an uncomfortable withdrawal, but not deadly. People develop tolerance to benzodiazepines. So you sometimes need to, over, over the years, go to higher and higher doses and do become dependent on them. A big downside of benzodiazepines is that they are depressants. So even if they're decreasing anxiety, they can worsen depressive illness. And depression and anxiety often have a lot of comorbidity, often uh, coexist in a person. So the worry of someone with an anxiety disorder developing depression is a very real one. So anything that can increase that risk, like benzodiazepines or alcohol um, or marijuana, um, is something to really avoid. They also have cognitive um, problems. and and seem to, there's some evidence that they increase in the long-term risk of things like dementia. They can be dangerous with alcohol, et cetera. There's a lot of downsides for benzodiazepines, but maybe most importantly, um, they prevent the person from coming up with more reasonable coping strategies for that anxiety, the sort of things you learn in therapy, um, and they're not a long-term solution. Unlike SSRIs, which you've already got about again from Dr. Swartz, which work in the serotonin system, they're often used for depression, a variety of other psychiatric conditions, including OCD, and many anxiety disorders. But SSRIs are one of the most commonly prescribed uh, medications for anxiety disorders. We call them antidepressants, but in, in fact, SSRIs are more commonly prescribed for anxiety disorders than for depression because there is so much more prevalence of anxiety disorders in our country. So they're, given, they're prescribed generally uh, for lots of anxiety disorders. I mentioned before, they do take six to eight weeks for a full effect, although you might feel an effect earlier. And some patients even experience sort of an early activation or sort of like when they first start taking the SSRIs, they might um, uh, feel a little better, maybe temporarily, um, but the real full effect does take six or eight weeks. And I'm sure to talk to you about some of the more um, detailed aspects of SSRIs, but I will say an important thing I like to re-emphasize for everybody when, I'm, um, when they're starting an SSRI is that when there are side effects to SSRIs, because sometimes they'll have side effects like dry, dry mouth or stomach ache or trouble sleeping, that kind of thing, most often, if someone does have any of those side effects, most people don't, but if they do, they tend to go away within a week or two as your body gets used to the medicine at any given dose. I usually ask people to give it at least a week or two to see if the side effects are gonna get any better. They can also decrease libido or sex drive. And that one can also get better over time, but I've actually found that one less often um, gets all the way better and, and might be an indication it's time to try a different SSRI or a different class of drugs. All right, so just because it's coming up to 2.15, I want to just conclude. Anxiety, worry, and fear are useful and essential biological processes, but if they are overcalibrated or they misfire or overactivate, you can develop a, that's what we call it, an anxiety disorder. And they can cause dysfunction, disability, morbidity, and even mortality um, with things like suicide. But 
anxiety disorders can be treated by psychiatrists and other mental health professionals, and patients can improve dramatically. Just like you heard from Dr. Swartz on depression, these are very treatable illnesses. The, the greatest tragedy in psychiatry, in my mind, is the fact that people don't recognize how treatable these illnesses can be when you find the right treatment or combination of treatments. And because they think that they're not treatable, they might be reluctant to seek help thinking it won't help. It will help. I, I wouldn't have a job if it didn't. I promise you, these treatments will help.